Our speaker of the hour is Daniel Denham. We've been pleased to have Daniel stay with us during this lectureship. I can understand why back some years ago, David Brown made a statement that says, if you want somebody to be your moderator, that is your, your assistant in a debate, you want Daniel. Man's got an incredible memory. <laughs> I asked him about it and he says he's been blessed with something closely akin to a photographic memory. So if you want to know a lot of things about a lot of things, just ask Daniel, he'll, he'll know it. And uh, I, I appreciate that of him. <laughs> well, I think Daniel probably run a close second <laughs> in that department. <laughs> we appreciate him so very much. The most important thing about him, he's Megan's dad. <laughs> he's an able gospel preacher. He's uh, preached in a lot of places. Uh, he is currently in North at the North River Congregation in Parrish, Florida. And I want to say this, I appreciate it. We got a, a large contingent from Florida here, and that, that's great. And I, I appreciate y'all traveling this, this far. And California too, I guess. <laughs> anyway, an able gospel preacher, what can I say? Daniel, come speak to us. It has been a delight to be here, even though I've been partially medicated in the process. Had just gotten over a bout with the flu and trying to keep this stuff or break this stuff up, up in my uh, lungs. And so uh, at times I've sort of dozed in and out. And, uh, but I have thoroughly enjoyed the lectures and have appreciated the tremendous work that's been done by this congregation, the elders, the ladies, Brother David, everyone uh, involved in this uh, endeavor. If you've never been involved in putting on a lectureship, you don't know what uh, goes on behind the scenes just to get everything in place. And it takes more than one person. It takes more than just several people. It takes a uh, whole effort by the uh, entire group. And we love and appreciate each of you, the Ross. We've thoroughly enjoyed I told uh, uh, Sister Ross, the, she has thoroughly spoiled us. Of course, last year, we got thoroughly spoiled by Sister Cone. And so... Uh, You've got some great ladies in this congregation. You're very blessed, and we wish for you many, many more great years and success in this area and in your work. Uh, I've worked with Brother David in a couple of debates. I, we're finding it hard to find opponents. And uh, in many respects, when you mention Brother David Brown as a debater, uh, with these folks, uh, they don't want to tangle with them. They really don't. And uh, we love and appreciate him and his stand for the truth and have known him for some time now. And uh, as he said the other day, he's still right where he's always been. We haven't moved. And uh, Lord willing, we will not. John 4, verse 24. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That is the classic text on New Testament worship. And it is the text that we're going to be dealing with this afternoon as we discuss the need to always worship God in spirit and in truth. We need to recognize the importance of doing things God's way. That is the infallible way. That is the proper way. That is what God would have us to do and how God would have us to live and ultimately how God would have us to be ready to meet Him in the judgment. We need to recognize that relative to the worship of God, 
that there is a proper realm for that worship. And uh, by that, I refer to the fact that the New Testament system is the ultimate system that God had in mind to establish uh, in eternity or from eternity in as much as he had the New Testament system itself in mind from eternity. The woman at the well, that is at Jacob's well at Sychar, perceived Jesus to be a prophet of God. As a result, she desired to know from him which form or place of worship was that which God really authorized. You see, the Samaritans worship in the temple built by Sanballat on Mount Gerizim, as her fathers had said. Uh, or was it uh, to take oh, this worship to take place in the temple at Jerusalem as the Jews claim? The Jews worship there. The Samaritans uh, in the uh, temple at Mount Gerizim. And uh, they even had their own copy of the Pentateuch, which they had altered to teach that it was to be on, on Mount Gerizim. Jesus' answer noted that the Jews knew whom they worshipped, he said, for salvation is of the Jews. That is, it would come through the Jewish nation. In other words, the Jews were right. However, there was a time coming when worship in either place would not be the norm under God's law. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him, John 4, verse 23. There then would be a change in the realm of worship. Worship would no longer occur at the temple at Mount Gerizim, or even in the temple at Jerusalem, which was then the proper place. The word true is especially significant. It's not, it not only conveys the idea of true as opposed to false or not true. It contextually is referring to a system that was distinct from that embodied in the worship then being observed by either the Samaritans or the Jews. Judaism was a type or shadow of that which was to come the true and the substance. The New Testament system of worship would supplant the Old Testament system of temple worship. The New Testament system would, would be predicated on the proposition that the God of heaven is not contained by the walls of any man-made temple, as Paul later would proclaim in Acts 17, 24, and 25. God is not a material being who is in need of material things for his life and sustenance. Thus, Jesus said to the woman, God is spirit. The indefinite article of the key, in the uh, KJV is really not needed. In Greek, when you have a noun without an article, most often the idea is to stress the essence, character, or nature of that which is under consideration. The force of the syntax is that God is non-corporeal. That's what's being stressed by the construction. He has no physical body but is in essence purely a spirit being. In fact, he is the father of spirits, Hebrews 12, verse 9. True worship would reflect the more proper connection and emphasis with the spiritual over the material. Judaic worship tended toward the material over the spiritual, with the latter being present but always hidden within the form, expressed by the type covered within the shadows of the law. Christian worship, however, brings the spiritual to the forefront and places the emphasis upon the Creator in a way that the previous systems of patriarchy and that of Moses could not. These served well for the purpose of preparing humanity for the coming of the gospel system, but could only accomplish so much. A truly universal system of worship with greater emphasis upon the spiritual nature of the Creator would be embodied in the New Testament system. Each of the previous stages had provided some light, though limited on the very nature of God himself. But the fuller revelation of this wondrous being was reserved for the coming of the Son of God near the close of the latter dispensation to prepare for the gospel age. As the starlight dispensation of patriarchy 
gave way to the moonlight dispensation of Moses, so the latter gave way to the sunlight dispensation of Jesus Christ, who, as the Son of Righteousness, had arisen with healing in his wings, Malachi 4, verse 2. The worship that he has devised, developed, and delineated in the New Testament is that which is binding upon us today. Gone are the Old Testament festivals and forms that emphasize the carnal and the physical, speaking mutely of that which was to come. Here now are the forms and substances of true worship, what worship ultimately was intended to be that would focus upon the worshiper's intents and purposes and aims in the direction of the great deity. That which recognizes and operates in harmony with the very spiritual nature of the proper object of worship to begin with. That's where the emphasis would be. I believe it is ironic that we live in a very materialistic age in which liberalism is desiring to try to bring back elements of the old law uh, if you go back just a few years and uh, note some things that uh, uh, have crept back in from the old Judaic system even among our brethren. One of the things they're observing are the old temple, the, the festivals trying to resurrect the Judaic festivals. Some years ago, one of the congregations in Nashville decided to have a a day of atonement in which the elders wrote the names of the members in what was a symbolic book of life. And then they went down into the basement that they had designated as the holiest of all in order to place that document symbolically in the Holy of Holies. Now just think about that. And that was part of their worship. It is blasphemy. And this is now what is in vogue. The emphasis upon the material, upon the emotional, upon the physical, and not upon the spiritual element of New Testament worship. The very emphasis of worship is to be on the proper object and that proper object is is essentially a spirit being. And uh, in fact, that is his very character, his very nature, and uh, he desires what his creatures uh, can give him as he made them. Now think about this object. And there indeed is a proper object of worship. God is spirit and they that worship him. From the very start we need to recognize that worship is not about the worshiper. It's not about pleasing ourselves. It's not about drawing attention to ourselves. It's not about emphasizing ourselves. It is not about pleasing ourselves making ourselves feel good about ourselves. That's not the nature of the worship. God is the proper object of worship, and He only desires uh, the right kind of worship. He rightly deserves worship. Whatever worship entails, He's the rightful recipient of it. Men are not to be the object of worship. When Cornelius fell down at the feet of Peter and worshipped him, Peter said, Stand up, I myself also am a man. Acts 10, verse 25 and 26. And so he was rebuked for trying to worship Peter when the apostle John fell down before an angel to worship him. The angel rebuked him, saying, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and thy brethren, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19, 10. And so you can't even worship angels. We must worship God. He is the proper object. And the reason being, God uh, deserves worship because He's the creator of all things. Right there is sufficient reason as to why we should worship Him. He created all things. Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. And uh, He created us. He deserves worship because He's the owner. He is the sustainer. Everything belongs to Him. 
The psalmist said the cattle on a thousand hills is his. And that itself is an expression to emphasize that all of the cattle belong to him. The idea of completion in the imagery. Every bit of them belong to him. He deserves worship because he provides everything that we enjoy in this world. He's the great benefactor of humanity, especially for his people. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James 1 verse 17. He's given us all things to enjoy. One of the things that gets off with me sometimes is to have someone say, I really don't need God. Or to have even members of the church say something along this line. Well, I believe in God, but, you know, uh, He's happy with just whatever I do. I, I, I don't really have to uh, worship Him and so on. And I don't need Him as much in my life. They feel self-satisfied. And I've had brethren actually say that over the years. I'm happy with the way my life is. Well, you just think about this. If you don't need God, why don't you stop breathing His air? Why don't you stop drinking His water, enjoying His sun, enjoying His skies, walking on His green grass? Get off the planet. Because it is His property. He owns it, lock, stock, and barrel. And by the way, He owns you too. If you don't think you need Him... Do you think your house needs you? Hmm? How would your house do without you? In fact, some people's houses might actually improve if certain people <laughs> moved out and moved on. But people have, you talk about gall to say, well, I believe it, but I don't really need it. The atheist, he says, I don't believe in God. Oh, not until he dies. Not until he dies, and then every one of them start crying out to him. Brother Tom Warren said of Carl Sagan, you know the one thing that death makes of all men? It makes everyone a believer. Too late for most. But death is a great equalizer in that respect. Everyone becomes a believer. God deserves worship. Worship is not to please us. The story is told about Bill Moyer that he was leading a prayer in the White House when Lyndon Johnson was in office. Johnson interrupted him as he was prone to do on so many occasions. And he said, speak up, I can't hear you. Mr. Moyers re reported to have said, I'm not speaking to you. <laughs> We're not here to please God or to please one another. We're here to please God. We're here to please Jehovah. And uh, we need to understand that relative to our acts, relative to what we do in worship. And in that regard of things, or to that regard, we need to recognize that, uh, for instance, when it comes to singing, I'll say a little more about this in a moment. The text does not say sing well. It simply says sing, doesn't it? If it says sing well, then Buddy and I would both be in trouble. I've had people ask me, can you sing south of the border? And then they would say, I'd say yes, and they'd say, please do. Singing is not one of my strengths. But God be thanked, he didn't say sing well. He didn't say sing like Pavarotti. He didn't say sing like Jim Reeves. He didn't say sing like Kitty Wells. He simply said sing. Some of our brethren wouldn't pass the breath test. Years ago, Years ago, when people died, they had certain tests they did. Sometimes they'd poke them with a pen to see if they reacted, if the, you know, to make sure they were dead. Or they'd do other things. 
And one of them was they put a mirror up to the mouth and see if there was any mist or anything on the mirror. Kind of, and they called it the breath test. When we're singing, there are some brethren that would not pass the breath test because they don't even open their mouth, much less have anything coming out. The text says, sing. Why? Because God wants it. Because God deserves it. Because our worship must be aimed to and for God's benefit for God's honor, for God's glory. And we're going to say more about the nature of worship in just a moment. The first day of the week, our Sunday, is called the Lord's Day for a reason, brethren. Revelation 1 verse 10. It's no accident that the Greek term koriakos that is used there uh, is a term uh, that uh, is used only one other time in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 20. And there it's used of the Lord's Day, or of the Lord's Supper. And uh, it's fitting because the, we have the royal feast on the royal day. The phrase, the day of the Lord, with Koriakos, by the second century was used exclusively of the first day of the week. Exclusively. And uh, for that very reason. The brethren were observing the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week. It, it is viewed as belonging to Him. And He deserves our worship on that day. He deserves it at any time, but especially on that day. And it is pictured as a royal or the royal day. The most common term that is used for of the Lord or belonging to the Lord is, kur, is kuriu, not kuriakos. And... Uh, we need to recognize the importance of the Lord's Day assembly and assemblies on the first day of the week because it points to the fact that God is the proper object of our worship. There's also the proper attitude that ought to be involved in our worship. Man is to worship God in spirit. Again, the text reads in part, God is spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So for our worship to be acceptable, it must involve our spirit. Some brethren have jumped on this and said, well, that's the Holy Spirit. Again, nonsense. There is no reason uh, to uh, hold that position. Nothing in the text suggests it. But rather it is the human spirit, despite this current spirit mania that has overtaken liberal brethren, including the Devers. It is the human spirit which the Lord speaks, speaks of. By it, he has reference to the right attitude, the right disposition of heart and mind, the right focus of one's reflections and thoughts. He is teaching that man's own uh, uh, attitudes and own spirit must be involved in the act of worship. We must engage our intellect, our emotional and volitional powers must be involved as well. Doing the right things without the right attitude is utterly meaningless. This is because the very basic uh, nature of worship is to pay homage or adoration to God. This is the essential significant, uh, significance of the word proskuneo. To worship is the idea of homage, adoration. That's how, that's how the word developed, what it came to mean by the first century. The paying of homage, adoration, uh, abeyance to deity. And uh, it involves specific acts. And we're going to look at those in just a moment. We must recognize the importance of the right attitude. In Joshua's great farewell discourse, he has a similar text. Which reads, Now therefore fear the Lord... And serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood. And in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. Notice you have in sincerity and in truth. You have those two ideas. Well sincerity involves the human mind. The spirit. The proper disposition. Whereas the, the truth, as we're going to note, has to do with doing things according to God's Word. 
While the broader term serve is used in Joshua's statement, it still deals within itself with the same basic truth that the proper attitude is needed, whether in serving God, the larger class of which worship is a part, or in worshiping God, the more specific form of service. All worship is service, even though not all service rendered to God uh, or on God's behalf is worship. And that's an important distinction. That the two are different is seen in the Lord's statement in Matthew 4 verse 10. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. It's fascinating that this is a statement made in Deuteronomy applied to the Old Testament. The Lord uh, quotes it and cites it. Uh, and yet, uh, and, and brethren who have held to the all life is worship doctrine will try to say that all service is worship and uh, so on, that they are equal and therefore all life is worship. Uh, yet, here the Lord in Matthew 4 verse 10 makes a statement that ultimately is applied to the New Testament as well. Yet they recognize that under the Old Testament system, there was a distinction between service and worship. Well, if it taught a distinction in service and worship in the Old Testament, it has to teach it also in the New. Christians are to cultivate the right condition of heart that permeates their being with the right disposition to be able to humbly, lovingly and reverently approach the throne of God in bestowing the kind of worship he desires and properly deserves. We are to serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12, 28 and 29. And that applies not only to his service in general, that especially applies to his worship. Chewing bubble gum, clipping fingernails, Talking on the cell phone, text messaging, listening to a radio program or recording through a sound device, thinking about the dinner one's planning, thinking about or focusing on the coming football game in the afternoon or evening or the baseball game that night, or any number of other distractions should not be found among those who profess to be true worshipers of God when they are in the act of worshiping those things need to be put aside such worship is vain it's fruitless it's empty it's barren of any meaning and usefulness it is stillborn it is an expression uh, that uh, of uh, uh, it is an expression of uh, not properly understanding the importance of uh, approaching God with the right attitude. But we must have the proper perspective of love and admiration for God. He also must recognize, that is the true worshiper, that his worship is to be reverent and fervent in order to show the kind of respect and all that God rightly deserves from his creature. So we need to appreciate the uh, importance of worship. And treat it not as an obligation. I think that's part of the problem. We treat worship as an obligation. Rather than a marvelous privilege. If we viewed our worship as a privilege. We would not be saying well I've got to go to church. I've got to go worship. That type of language would be banished from our vocabulary. We'd stop speaking in those type of terms. Rather, we should think in terms of, I want to go to worship. I want to be with brethren. I want to serve my God. I want to give Him the praise. Brother Turner used to say in class, Brother Rex Turner, he said, we have brethren that will come in and they'll sit there in the pews and they get this long face and they look at you with this uh, uh, appeal as though uh, they're saying well I'm here now hurry it up and get it over with and that's the way they treat the worship and he said God's not pleased with that while we are to worship God our worship ought to flow from our hearts 
filled with love for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We ought to treasure the time that we're able to spend together as brothers and sisters in Christ expressing our mutual thanksgiving and obeisance to God. No greater privilege can be afforded on this earth than to have the right to approach the presence of God through the means of worship in the accepted and blessed way that he has laid out in Holy Writ. Those who do not avail themselves of this privilege are robbing themselves of a great blessing. They're robbing also uh, their brethren uh, in Christ of the full benefits and blessings uh, that pertain to worship. But most of all, they're robbing God of what he rightly deserves. You think about it. If you don't have the right attitude, your worship is meaningless. If I don't have the right attitude, my worship's meaningless. We're not worshiping. If worship by its very nature involves the expression of homage, adoration, love, and appreciation, that's the very essence of it. We don't have that. You can do all the acts that you possibly can do and, and a thousand more. And it's not getting any higher than the ceiling. Brother U.L. Allen said relative to, relative to prayer that if you don't have the right attitude in the, in the course of the prayer and you're not praying in the right way, you may as well save your breath to blow your coffee. Because that's the way it is. You're just wasting it. There are proper acts in worship. Worship by definition involves... Actions that express that homage or adoration. That's, again, implicit in the definition of the term. The very presence of the verb proskuneo implies action, something which is to be done. Jesus goes further to state that we must worship not only in spirit, but also in truth. John 4, verse 24, worshiping in truth means that we're worshiping in keeping with the word of God. Again, a liberal approach to this text has taken on this idea. We are to worship in spirit. Uh, as I said, they oftentimes say that's the Holy Spirit. And in sincerity. In fact, a few years ago, there was a paper that was circulated uh, by a, a missionary overseas who was advocating that position that truth here should be translated sincerity. But that's not how the word truth, aletheia, is used in the book of John. It's not used with that meaning. Look at John 1 verse 17, for example. The law came by Moses, but the grace and the sincerity came by Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? No, it is the truth, a system of truth, a particular body of truth. John 5 verse 33, John the Baptist, Jesus said testified or bore witness unto the sincerity is, is that John just bore witness to what was sincere no that's not what Jesus is talking about he's talking about the word of God the truth the teaching of the word John 8 verse 32 ye shall know the truth ye shall know the sincerity and the sincerity shall make you free you see what these brethren are saying is as long as you're sincere, as long as you have joy, as long as you want to praise God, God's going to be, be pleased whatever you do. Doesn't matter what the Word says. It's just a matter of how you feel about it. So I ask them. The question I like to ask is, okay, as long as you have joy, as long as you're praising God, as long as your intent is sincere, why don't you offer human sacrifice? Oh, that would be murder. How do you prove that? By implication. And these are the same people that say implication you can't use. And so they wind up meeting themselves coming back. They give up their own doctrine. They reject implication and yet they have to now appeal to implication to get around these things. Michael Hatcher also has several questions he likes to hit them with. And they accuse us of double teaming. them. <laughs> but uh, it's just pure nonsense. 
John 8, 32. John 8, 44 and 45 says, And because I tell you the truth, particularly verse 45, because I tell you the sincerity, ye believe me not. That doesn't make sense there either, does it? It's because I tell you the truth. That is God's word. You don't believe me. John 14, 26. This is a promise made to the apostles that the Spirit would guide them into all the what? Truth. Try to plug the word sincerity in there and see how much sense that makes. Doesn't make a lick of sense. Then, John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy sincerity, thy sincerity, or thy word is sincerity. That don't make sense either. Just absolute nonsense. But that's what liberalism does to the word of God. Really, what Terry was talking about when he was referring to these people, uh, and their attitudes toward God, their definition of who and what God is and their concept of God. What we have is a nation of people who profess to believe in God or a God, but they do not believe God. They don't believe what God has said about himself. And in reality, they don't believe in the God of the Bible. They don't believe in the real, the true, and the living God, the God who made heaven and earth and who is going to hold them to account for how they have lived their lives here. They have adopted a God that will not talk back to them. They've adopted a God that will allow them to do whatever they want to do in any way they want to do it for whatever purpose they want to do it and who will not say boo to them about it. That's the nature of it. That's the kind of God they want. That's the popular type of God. And that people can say, well, I'm a worshiper of God because I'm sincere about what I believe. And in reality, they don't believe in God. Well, there are five acts of worship. One act of worship is that of singing, as we pointed out. Uh, the text does not say, the Bible does not say that we are to sing well. It simply says sing. Christians need to realize that singing is not designed to please themselves, but rather to please God. We need to understand that the words are important. We need to pay attention to our words, brethren. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in the melodies, in the beauty of the, of the, the sound of things, that we forget about the most important point or part, we're to be teaching and admonishing one another. As Brother Summers demonstrated, we're to teach and admonish. That means open up your mouth and talk. You have to speak. Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That means I sing to you and you sing to me. Now, brethren, I'm tone deaf. I'm tone deaf, which means I don't hear everything quite as well as other people who are not tone deaf. So, however it comes across, you're not going to offend me. <laughs> because you don't sound nearly as good as you think you do, <laughs> at, least, at least to these ears. And, and that's just the way it is. Many brethren understand that the New Testament does not authorize mechanical instruments of music. And yet, we have them now arguing for humming, for whistling, for beatboxing. That's where you, you make uh, com uh, uh, compression type sounds with your mouth and, uh, or use your, your uh, mouth to use your vocal cords to reproduce the sounds of musical instruments. There's no authority for that. The Bible says sing. It specifies the kind of music. I've heard brethren say, oh, the Bible authorizes vocal music. That's only partially true. It authorizes a specific kind of vocal music. Humming is vocal music, but humming is not authorized. Singing is what's authorized. A second act of worship is the giving of our means. 
The early churches practiced this part of the New Testament uh, worship, Acts 2, verse 42, the word fellowship there, koinonia, without doubt is contemplating the giving of means. That bit, giving was to be purpose, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. It was to be proportional, uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5, and it was to be done in the proper spirit, that is, as a cheerful giver, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. It also concerned a particular day, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. We now have some brethren who are arguing that there's no authority to take up a contribution on the Lord's Day. Do you know that? The brethren at McClish Avenue in Ardmore, Oklahoma now arguing that. Or at least uh, one of their preachers is taking that position. He's been challenged to debate by a number of brethren and so far hasn't agreed. A third act of worship in the New Testament is that of prayer. All too often prayer is treated as a uh, perfunctory act in worship. Just something we do because, before we move on to something of more, more importance. But, war, but prayer is so vital. Our prayers must arise from the proper condition of life. It is the prayer of a righteous man that avails much, James 5.16. It must have the proper reverence. Matthew 6, verse 9, we need to pray our Father who art in heaven, or words to that effect, recognizing God's authority and power. Our prayers ought to be coupled also with a proper determination to obey, as uh, Brother Bruce uh, dealt with. A fourth act is that of preaching. The early church was steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2, verse 42. Again, this is stated by Luke in connection with other acts of worship. Paul, in Acts 20, verse 7, following preached during the services of the congregation at Troas. And then, of course, you have the Lord's Supper. We must get back to New Testament worship and honor. The early church took it seriously. And the church, at least for the most part since the Restoration Movement, took it seriously. Now it's become clowns and circuses. And we got clowns in the pulpit. Clowns leading singing or leading praise teams. And it's the feel-good, let, let your hair down and just have a good time nonsense that has taken over. God's not pleased with that. Again, we're so pleased to have a good study of worshiping God in spirit and what that means and in truth and, and what that means. I was a little concerned knowing this probably would go off and he had already said he was tone deaf. <laughs> but he heard it. Thank you, Brother Daniel, for the good job and for your work in general in the kingdom. We'll stay, uh, we'll stand dismissed for about five minutes and then we'll come back for our last session.